2 Chronicles chapter 32, we read that when Hezekiah prepares the people for the coming of the Assyrian, he knows that the Assyrian is going to come to Jerusalem. He set captains of war, verse 6, over the people and gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city and spake comfortably to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that's with him. For there is more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is Yahweh our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. It's such a moving speech. Don't forget, this is in the 14th year of King Hezekiah. He is seriously unwell. And that faithful king gets himself off his bed and he gets down and he gets in front of the people. This is a real leader. A real leader will be prepared to to go through difficult challenges for themselves in order to speak with their people. And he speaks comfortably to them, saying, be strong and courageous. Now you imagine that you're Hezekiah. The rulers of the city have come to you that morning and said, all right, what do you want to say? And he says, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll speak. Gather the people together, get them into the street, into the broad street it was, at the gate of the city. Tell them that, gather the people, I'll be there. Are you, are you sure? Are you, I'll, I'll be there. And this king, as he lies on his bed, collecting his thoughts, as any good leader does, what, what is it that I'm going to say? What words can I use? Brothers and sisters, have you ever had that? Where you've gone to maybe visit someone in hospital. You're so worried about the situation. The Assyrian is looming so large in their life. And you ask yourself the question, what, what am I going to say? And here's the answer. Here's the answer. Reflect on Scripture. It's not about what you, as it were, are going to say. Because we'll always get it wrong. What we're going to do is lean on Scripture. What do men of faith do? Men of faith lean on men of faith. And so, if I show you on the screen now, we can see, and you know many of these phrases, he spake comfortably to them. Well, Isaiah 40, we see that the, 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 the call that Jerusalem can be comforted. A, a more obvious one, be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed. He's remembering, isn't he, what Joshua said to the people when they were going to go into the land. And they were worried, you know, that, that yes, this was the faithful group. This was the next generation. But, but they were still nervous about the giants and the, and the, the walls that were so large on, on the towns and the cities in Canaan. But Joshua's message was be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed. Hezekiah, what can I say? What can I, I'll use Joshua. I'll, I'll use what Joshua said. That, that will be helpful in this occasion. The Assyrian, don't be afraid of the Assyrian, for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that's with him. There's be more with us than with him. Oh, I remember Elisha. Do, do, do you remember Elisha? Should we go to that one? 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. You remember that this is the king of Syria now that is come against uh, Israel, and they're in dire straits. They're, 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 they're extremely stressed and anxious because the, the, the Syrian is so powerful. And Elisha, well, he's not the least bit concerned. He's absolutely fine by it. In fact, he's in bed. 
much like Hezekiah. And of course, the servant is stressed out of his brain, isn't he? Saying, do you realize that we're surrounded? That the, 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 the king of Syria, we're surrounded. We're doomed, we're done for, the servant says. Verse 15 of 2 Kings 6. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And so as Hezekiah lies on his bed, what can I say? What can I say? Oh, I'll tell them about Elisha. I'll tell them about Elisha. When there was a siege and there seemed to be an enormous army, but Elisha wasn't concerned because the angels were innumerable in multitude. There was more with us than with them. He goes on to say, with him as an arm of flesh, with us is Yahweh our God to help us, to fight our battles. Now, interesting, that phrase, fight our battles, we only come across here and in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Just, just quickly turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And you remember that Samuel warns the people about wanting their own king. But the people say, we want a king, verse 20, we want to be like all the nations, 1 Samuel 8 verse 20, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Well, Hezekiah can't do it. He's nearly dead. But he wants them to know what the nation should always have known before they even wanted a king. It doesn't make any difference that the king's on his deathbed. Because Yahweh, our God, will fight our battles. Brothers and sisters, it is the same for us today. That when we don't quite know what to say, when we're faced with that challenging situation, when we're, we're trying to, to speak to someone whose life is in an absolute mess or they're, they're chronically poorly or something's gone really wrong, we just have got to allow ourselves to reflect on Scripture. Let the Lord our God do the talking and fight our battles. And so we read that the people rested themselves upon the words of King Hezekiah. Just turn to Isaiah 26. We're going to come back to Isaiah 26 later in our studies this morning. Isaiah 26 We read in verse 3. Then wilt thou keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. This is the spirit. This is the rest, whose mind is stayed on thee. This is the rest, the perfect peace that Hezekiah was able to give the people. Yesterday we reflected, didn't we, on the sheer brutality of the Assyrians. How horrendous it was. How difficult it would have been to lead the nation for Hezekiah at this time. And yet what he does is he leans on men of faith. Because that's what men of faith do. And that's, brothers and sisters, what we need to be prepared to do in our lives. And so the Rabshakeh comes, the servant of Sennacherib, he comes, and of course he starts to call Hezekiah and the nation, the people, out for putting their trust in God. And I want you to do an exercise. Someone said to me yesterday that they like doing these exercises. Now, I imagine that probably the rest of you don't like doing them, but because, because me and this brother do like doing them, we're going to do them, all right? So... I'm going to put a little table on the screen for you here because I want you, and I'd suggest you go to the king's record, go to 2 Kings 18. So the right-hand side is your sort of base verses, as it were, in the life of Hezekiah. And you can see that they're based in 2 Kings 18 and 19. And you know that, uh, that what the Rabshakeh does is he comes and reproaches defies, blasphemes the living God. Now, there's an answer sheet, but you can't see that yet, okay? So, should we say five minutes? 
All right, five minutes, see if you can fill in the blanks. Off you go. Okay, sorry, brothers and sisters, to take six minutes. It, uh, Brother Stephen just wouldn't stop talking. Um, uh, you'll be shocked to hear. Um, <clears throat> oh, come on. Come on. He jabbed at the Welshman the other day. I didn't see anyone making any big fuss about it then. <laughs> see me under the bus, no problem at all. Oh, dear. All right, he knows I love him. Right, so 1 Samuel 17 and, uh, and 2 Kings. So have you got a marker in both? You see, and here's the point that we're trying to illustrate in, in, in just doing that exercise quickly amongst ourselves. That the Rabshakeh, that, that Sennacherib, that Goliath, that these characters, they represent the same thing. They represent a system that is against God. The word reproach, in, in the Samuel record, 1 Samuel 17, it's actually used on, 70, on six occasions, rather. It's 1 Samuel 17. That word is used on six occasions. It's the Hebrew word that we see elsewhere translated defy in that, in that particular chapter, or defied. So six occasions, the number of man, Goliath defies, he reproaches. And the word is the word blasphemed. So where do we pick that up in the New Testament? Which system do we see blaspheming against the living God? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the sort of the, the, the papacy, the, the, the Roman system that the Assyrian is an early runner of. That these systems defy, reproach, blaspheme the living God. But they can be subtle. They can be subtle. Come with me back to 2 Kings chapter 18. Let me show you how subtle this sin system, this blasphemous system can be. The Rabshaker here is smart. He's got to convince the people not to trust in Hezekiah. Verse 20. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust on him. But if you say to me, we trust in Yahweh our God, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and has said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? And so he's saying, you give pledges. Verse 23. Now therefore, I pray thee, give pledges. Look in the margin for the word pledges. Give hostages to my Lord, the King of Assyria, and I'll give you 2,000 horses. Imagine being the king in this situation as the Rab Shaker is asking for hostages to take away. But he's subtle. He's so subtle in his approach. Verse 24. How then will thou turn away the face of one captain, the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Now look in your margin. Where is the Rabshaker quoting from? Can you see... It's in Isaiah chapter 30. Do you see next to verse 24, almost all of you will have in your margins, Isaiah 30 and verse 1. Now he goes on in, it, to, to, in his speech, and look what else he says later on. Verse 30, Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in Yahweh, saying, Yahweh will surely deliver us to this city, and it will not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not, verse 31, he says to Hezekiah. For thus says the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, that ye may eat every man of his own vine, and every one of his own fig tree, and drink every one of the waters of his cisterns. Every man of his own vine, every man of his own fig tree, 
Which prophet is he quoting from now? Micah. We might put in the margin, Micah 4, verse 4. Now what's happening here? What is it that's happening? Well, the rab shaker knows. In order to convince the people to give themselves in and the Assyrian army not to have to lay siege to the city, he's going to have to convince them by their own prophets. And so he's subtle, he's smart enough, he's clever enough to draw out from the great prophets at the time, Isaiah and Micah, and use their very words, but twisting them to deceive the nation. That's what the apostasy does. That's what the Roman system, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, we looked at it last night, didn't we? We come down to the Roman system. It's the same system that gives an appearance of credibility. Well, did, 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 did you hear? Did, did, did you notice? In fairness to, to, to the rab shaker, I mean, he was, he was actually quoting Isaiah. He, 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 do you know, he picked up on Micah too. Did you hear him pick up on Micah too? Well, you know, or well, well, maybe he's right. We've got to be so careful that we don't get caught up in allowing ourselves, hearing the messages of apostate churches, to think, well, you know, it seemed there or thereabouts. Yeah, they quoted Isaiah, they quoted Micah. We've got to be discerning and smart, listening carefully, that we're not deceived. This, of course, is the lie of the serpent. Verse 32. He says, until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of corn and wine, of bread and vineyards, of olive oil and, and honey, that ye may live and not die. Now, I can't resist doing this in a particular voice. So, so he says, listen, that ye may live and not die, right? It's the voice of the serpent, right? It was brilliant, wasn't it? Thank you. Excellent. Right answer. Yeah, it's the voice of the serpent that you, that you may live and not die. That is Genesis 3, verse 4. We put it in our margin. That we spot it, that we see it. That's what the apostate church has done. It's just said to the world, you're going to live and not die. Don't worry about ensuring that your life is aligned with the Lord Jesus Christ and the page of scripture set out from Genesis to Revelation. You're going to live and not die. That's what the serpent does. And so we see in his reproach that Hezekiah answers, 2 Kings 19 and verse 4. He says, it may be that the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. So we see Isaiah intervening here. And we want to notice that he's been sent to reproach the living God. And we pick up that phrase, the living God, in 1 Timothy. So keep a marker or, or, or make a note of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. We only want uh, one verse, and then we'll take one other verse in 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 4, we read in verse 10. For therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially 
of those that believe. These things command and teach. And so, brothers and sisters, in our lives, we're being told when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, we are going to suffer reproach. We're going to have the likes of Rabshakeh come to our front door and going to make our lives challenging and difficult. And in so doing, they're approaching the living God. But we trust in the living God. Like who? Hezekiah. The one who trusted like no other king before him on the throne in Israel or Judah or after him. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. We pick up this phrase again. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. We, we live... You live in the United States, most of you. The most affluent society in the world. Now, you know very well there's the abject poverty in the United States too. But, but the reality is that for most of our lives, we're, we're relatively comfortable. We're relatively comfortable. And we can allow ourselves to get caught up in a materialistic society with riches and thinking we can solve our own problems. <clears throat> It didn't make any difference how much money the northern kingdom of Israel had when the Assyrian came down. They took the lot and they still came back. It didn't make any difference how rich the southern kingdom of Israel was. Hezekiah gave money across. He took the gold off the doors of the temple. He took gold out of his own house. And the Assyrian came back. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. You can't deal with King Sin. So we don't trust it. We put all of our trust in the living God. Now come with me back to the record um, in Kings. And we know, don't we, the story well. <clears throat> that the city gets surrounded. And we're interested to see the archaeological evidence. The Taylor Prism um, has the record of the Syrian annals, the Assyrian annals. It was found by uh, an archaeologist um, uh, named someone Taylor um, in the, towards the beginning of the 1800s in Nineveh um, in Assyria. And the Taylor prism is remarkable because it shows us exactly what took place. As for Hezekiah the Judite, who did not submit to my yoke, writes the Assyrian king. 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as the small towns in their area, which without number, by leveling with battering rams and by bringing up siege engines, by attacking and storming on foot, by mines, tunnels and breaches, I besieged and took them. 200,150 people, great and small, Male, female, horses, mules, asses, camels, cattle, sheep without number. I brought them from them and counted as spoil. We know the record makes abundantly clear to us that the towns and cities of Judah fell. You weren't safe in Judah. There was only one place you were safe. You couldn't go down to Egypt. The Assyrians swept down into Egypt. Of course, you were never going to go north to Israel. Israel had already fallen to the Assyrian. There was only one place you were safe. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. Where had the water source been diverted? Into the city of Jerusalem. It is the only place of sanctuary. And so look what he says. Himself... He's speaking about the, the Hezekiah, the Judite, of course. Like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. He doesn't say, it's actually really frustrating. We weren't able to defeat the Jer Jerusalem. In fact, 185,000 of my soldiers died. He says that they shut up Hezekiah like a caged bird. And brothers and sisters, we just wonder if it really was like a cage bird. 
We know from the king's record, verse 36, that uh, the end of chapter 18, apologies, 2 Kings 18, verse 36, that the people had been asked by King Hezekiah to hold their peace and answer him not a word. So you, you've got to hold your peace. No matter what you hear, Hezekiah's message to them is, no matter what you hear from the Rabshakeh, from the king if he comes, Sennacherib, hold your peace. Now, we've already seen Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. So I believe, brothers and sisters, ordinarily speaking, when the Assyrian would come and lay siege to a city, I dread to think the noises that you would hear inside that village or that town or that city. Mothers weeping for what's going to happen to their husbands, to their children. Fathers trying to do the right thing and running around, shouting instructions. When the Assyrian laid siege to your town, to your city, there would be chaos and confusion inside. As people desperately, desperately, you think what they'd done before Hezekiah comes off his deathbed. We know that in Jerusalem, when the rulers had been in charge, they'd dropped all the walls of their own houses to strengthen the walls. Imagine the noise as they put the bricks, brought them. But now Hezekiah, he's off his deathbed. And he said to them, you don't say a word. And 185,000 soldiers march into position to surround the city. And these soldiers, well, they're getting ready to do what? Soldiers did terrible atrocities that they, that they committed. But this is different because Jerusalem is silent, save. In the middle of the city is the temple. And the role of the Levites that we know that Hezekiah has now reset was to stand every morning to thank and praise Yahweh and likewise at even. There is silence in Jerusalem. Except in the morning, the song of praise drifts over the city walls. In the evening, the song of praise drifts over the city walls. What do we think they might be singing? I wonder. Isaiah 26. Come on, come with me there. Isaiah 26. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in Yahweh forever, for in Yah, Yahweh is everlasting strength. We wonder that Isaiah 26 was being sung over the walls of Jerusalem. Isaiah 12, we wonder that they sang Isaiah 12 too. In that day, Isaiah 12, verse 1. In that day thou shalt say, O Yahweh, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for Yah, Yahweh is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore with joy will you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Do you remember on Sunday morning in our exhortation, I read to you from the history books. And the history books tell us that on each day of the Feast of Tabernacles, 
the priest went down to the waters of Siloam, to the pool of Siloam. They drew water out. They walked back to the city and we're told that they sang Isaiah 12. In that day, shall he say, praise Yahweh, call upon his name, declare his doings among the peoples, make mention that his name is exalted, sing unto Yahweh, he's done excellent things, this is known in all the earth, cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee, silence for the rest of the day. And at even, O Yahweh, I'll praise thee, the song goes again. We don't know what they sung. But we do know that the Assyrian king wrote on his annals that Hezekiah, the Judite king, was shut up like a caged bird. And a caged bird sings. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to show you something that I think is really thrilling. And I want you to turn to Acts 16. Come with me to Acts chapter 16. You remember in Acts chapter 16 that the Apostle Paul is with Silas. And they've come to the Roman colony of Philippi and they've been preaching there. And you remember that they deal with they, they help this girl who's got this spirit of python, this spirit of divination, spirit of sin, as it were, in her, which makes her masters furious when they heal her. And so Paul and Silas, well, they're thrown into the prison house. But what is it when they're in the inner prison that they do? They sing, don't they? Acts 16, verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. And suddenly there was the great earthquake. And of course, they didn't have to fight their own battle. God fought it for them. And they were released from the siege, as it were. They were released from the prison house within Philippi. And so you wonder that for Paul and Silas, the story of Hezekiah was key to them. Because what do men of faith do? Men of faith look to men of faith. And so as there they were in the prison house, thinking, what should we do? I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to sing. We're going to sing praises, just like those songs that came out across the walls of Jerusalem at the time of Hezekiah. We're going to sing. And so like cage birds, they sang. And what did they sing? Well, we wonder that they sang. Isaiah 26, Isaiah 12. I wonder that they also sang Psalm 124. When it comes to Psalm 124, we wouldn't be in the least bit dogmatic, brothers and sisters, about what they sang. Of course, we, we, we don't know. But it's always exciting, isn't it, to... To, to reflect and, and see if we can make some form of educated guess. Psalm 124. If it had not been Yahweh who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been Yahweh who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up alive when their wrath was kindled against us. Think of Paul and Silas here. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. Think of the Assyrian waters that come sweeping through. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be Yahweh, who's not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird. Out of the snare of the fowlers, the snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. And so, brothers and sisters, next time you're under siege, next time you're in the prison house, 
and you're struggling and you don't really know what to say, men of faith, go to men of faith. Open your hymn book. Sing a song. Brother Stephen Palmer is in our meeting. He told me the story not too long ago that he was in hospital visiting uh, an elderly sister who's, who fell asleep in hospital, um, who was obviously really poorly. And he was sat on the hospital bed um, and he said, I was, I was running out of things to say, Pete. I just, I, I just, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I'd said my thing and I was sat there and I was thinking, what do I say next? And he said, an angel walked in and the angel sat down at the end of the bed and said, let's read this psalm. And she started singing just gently this psalm. Uncle Stephen told me that story because that angel, well, she was my mum. Because that's all it takes. He said he just felt rescued from the situation. His own soul was lifted up. By the way, my mum won't mind you telling, me telling you, she hasn't got a brilliant voice. <laughs> She might mind, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Yeah. That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is, is it's the word of God. And that's all, in the end, we can offer. It's interesting that at this point in history, Sennacherib records this of himself on the Taylor Prism. Sennacherib, the great king, the mighty king, king of the world, king of Assyria, king of the four quarters, the wise shepherd, favorite of the great gods, guardian of right, lover of justice, who lends support, who comes to the aid of the destitute, who performs pious acts, perfect hero, mighty man, first among all princes. At this very point in history, Isaiah is recording the man who is going to be the mighty king, who will bring justice, who is the first among all princes. Where am I thinking? Isaiah 9. Thanks, Brother Jim. Isaiah 9. Just turn to Isaiah 9. Isn't it interesting that here is Sennacherib, here is King Sin. This is what King Sin does of itself. It elevates itself. And Isaiah, while Sennacherib is having recorded of him all the great titles that he sees of himself, Isaiah tells the nation, don't look to that man. Unto us, Isaiah 9 and verse 6, a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government of peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Yahweh of armies will perform this. And so, brothers and sisters, we don't ever allow ourselves to get caught up with the Assyrian system, the Roman system. What's the Roman system? Is it just the Roman Catholic Church? No, it's every apostate church. She's the mother of all harlots. We hold tight to the truth, ensuring that this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is our king and none other. I want us just for uh, a few moments, go back to the, the king's record, 2 Kings 19. And I want to show you uh, just a couple of examples of how this situation is pointing forward to the time of the end. 2 Kings chapter 19. We read in verse 34. That God says through Isaiah, I will defend this city to save it 
for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, Isaiah has been giving exactly the same message. Most of you will have in your margin Isaiah 31 verse 5, where Isaiah is saying the same thing. Yahweh will defend Jerusalem. He will save it. God will defend, save Jerusalem. We also read verse 35 of how the Assyrian was destroyed. It came to pass that night that the angel of Yahweh went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. You just picture the scene of the silence that had descended, not inside Jerusalem now, but outside Jerusalem. And you imagine some little boy who'd woken up early on that morning and snuck out. And he's thinking, I can't hear anything. And slowly, he peeks his head above the walls of the city. And everyone looks like they're very much fast asleep. But they're not fast asleep. They're dead. Because the angel of the Lord has done his work. 185,000 corpses surrounding the city of Jerusalem. Now, we bring that information to Zechariah chapter 12. And you remember that in Zechariah chapter 12, we're given prophecies of the time of the end. And we're told, and we've reflected already briefly on this this week, that when we become the immortal group of saints following the judgment seat, we will march, we describe this, don't we, sometimes from Revelation chapter 10 as the march of the rainbowed angel. Or we might describe it as the multitudinous Christ. Or we might describe it, Daniel 10 says, the one man. But this picture is of this immortal body of saints who go with the Lord Jesus Christ, the rainbow angel has the sun as its face, the sun of righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ is the head, but we're now utterly unified as one body. And we march and we go first to Judah and Jerusalem because the Gogian Confederacy has laid siege to Jerusalem, just like the Assyrian. The Gogian Confederacy is the latter-day Assyrian. And so much of Isaiah we're able to read with a mindset that we're learning about, yes, the time of Hezekiah and, and some of the other earlier kings uh, before Hezekiah, but we're also able to apply what we're reading there in Isaiah to the time of the end. No one would doubt that Isaiah 35, for example, that beautiful kingdom picture is about the kingdom and end times. So work back from Isaiah 35 and you see that that picture only comes about once you've seen the movements of the latter-day Assyrian coming against Jerusalem. And so we will go, verse 7, Yahweh also will save the tents of Judah first, the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Do not magnify themselves against Judah. So, so first of all, that we go and those tents of Judah, those just outside the city, we, we look after that the, that the inhabitants of Jerusalem that have this arrogance in them could allow themselves, well, yeah, we, we were involved with saving. No, 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 no. You had to be saved. But in that day, verse eight, shall Yahweh defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So there's our phrase from 2 Kings 19, verse 34. I will defend this city. Yes, he will. I will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He that's feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of Yahweh before them shall come to pass in that day. I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Just turn the page into chapter 14 of Zechariah. And in chapter 14, we're told that they will be smitten, verse 12, with a plague. This shall be the plague wherewith Yahweh will smite all the people that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes. Their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. The angel of the Lord will smite the camp, as it were, of the latter-day 
Assyrians. And so Jerusalem will be the only place left in the whole of the land of Israel in which there can be refuge. Woe to those that go down to Egypt. What does Gog do? Daniel chapter 11, we won't go there, sweeps right down into Egypt, just like the Assyrian did. Don't go to Egypt. It's a biblical principle. You don't lean on Egypt. Even the Rabshakeh knew it and was subtle enough to use it. We don't rely on Egypt. We stay in Jerusalem. And brothers and sisters, I imagine that on that morning, a runner had left the city to see what was the state of the Assyrian camp outside. 185,000 dead. The runner goes north up through the mountains. Where, 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 where are they? What's happened? Will you come with me finally to Isaiah 52? As the city of Jerusalem awakes on this particular morning, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. From henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised, the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bounds of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. And the runner has gone out and can see that the Assyrian's gone. As people wake up in the morning and they look out, the runner returns. How beautiful upon the mountains, verse 7, are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that says to Zion, thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. When Yahweh shall bring again Zion, break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste place of Jerusalem, for Yahweh has comforted his people. He's redeemed Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, do you want to be there in that day? when as part of the multitudinous Christ, as the rainbowed angel, we come to the Mount of Olives, the earthquake goes, there's chaos and confusion. Gog is being destroyed by fighting against each other. The plague of Zechariah 14 is moving through the Gogian confederacy. They're dropping. And we go into that city and we're able to say, thy God reigns. The watchmen are lifting up their voice. Together they're singing. They do now see eye to eye because Yahweh has brought again Zion. Do you want to be there when Jerusalem breaks into joy and sings together? For Yahweh has comforted his people. He's redeemed Jerusalem. If you want to be there, in that day, today, put all your trust in the page of Scripture, in our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Put all your trust on Him. And when you're struggling, remember, men of faith, lean on men of faith. Sing a song.